Would you love to improve your pronunciation today? Good afternoon. Welcome to the presentation number six of the first day of the conference challenges, opportunities, and reflections in EOT. My name is Caridad Ochoa. I'm a student in the seventh semester in the English language teaching major at UNAI. I will be responsible for hosting this presentation today and I'm excited to welcome Christian Pasos Lara, who is a just graduated English teacher from the Technical University of Ambato. He has been working as a teacher for almost two years in Ambato City. And this afternoon, he will present ELSA Speak application and the pronunciation. Please write your questions or comments in the chat. And at the end of his presentation, Christian will answer questions from our audience. And now he's, here's our guest, David. Um, and let's start with the presentation, please. OK, thank you, Caridad. Okay. Due to the fact that we are in a generation of students denominated a digital generation, we need to update and change their methodology, tools, and teaching techniques uh, to focus more on technological resources that motivate students to learn a new language. Uh, this pandemic has been a challenge and uh, an opportunity for teachers and students. And it has made um, education a totally different spin focused on, on technology, where face-to-face -face, uh, education has taken uh, a role in uh, the, a virtual education, causing uh, the educational system to include technological, digital, and, and virtual tools. Mobile assistant uh, language learning has been gaining a lot of uh, territory within the educational field and has made many advances in the world of artificial intelligence, which uh, helps students and teachers to, to facilitate the teaching learning process. Regarding learning the English language, many apps have been found on, and that are very useful within uh, to improve the language skills. The topic of this presentation is uh, the speak up and the pronunciation. Good afternoon with all. My name is Andres Pasos. And I have a degree in pedagogy in the, of the English language obtained at the Universidad Técnica de Ambato. And this is my educational and my personal email. So let's start. Pronunciation is an essential part of communication skills, which include uh, the correct intonation of words and the correct sound of language. This is because mispronouncing words can give a bad impression or misunderstanding and ineffectual communication. For this reason, a person can be perceived uh, as someone with a low level of, of English only because of his or her bad pronunciation. One of the problems found by the English as a foreign language learner regarding pronunciation is the influence of their, their native, lab, native language. Agudelo in 2017 stated that the majority of learners in Latin America have difficulties to pronounce or express themselves correctly in English because uh, they are affected by their, their mother tongue. Because uh, there are several native languages here in Ecuador and the accent and dialect is different in each region, it is difficult to find a way to get students to pronounce English correctly. According to, to the results obtained by the Education First Standard English Test of the EFZ test, where uh, 100 countries where English is not the mother tongue were evaluated. And Ecuador is among the countries with the lowest level of English in the world. And in a ranking of 100 countries, Ecuador was ranked in the 93 position. And in Latin America, it is in the last place in the rank. This is because um, there is no motivation in students to learn uh, a foreign language and the teaching methodology used uh, focus on traditional and boring, causing disinterest uh, and low grades in the, in the subject. 
for this reason, the main objective of the research is to, to determine the importance of using LSS pickup to develop pronunciation. So, in order to accomplish the objectives proposed in the research, it was necessary to establish another extra objectives that are first, uh, to identify the reasons that limit the English pronunciation. Second, to analyze the effect of using LSS pickup to develop pronunciation. Third, to establish uh, the relationship between LSS pickup and the improvement of, of the pronunciation. And finally, to know the student's perception regarding the use of LSS pickup. Well, now let's understand a little more about how the LSS pickup interface works. LSS pickup makes of a very advanced voice detector, which compares the user's pronunciation with that of a native American speaker. In order to take the test, the users must read a section of 16 sentences in which the difficulty of the sentences increase. The results uh, received in, of, the, of the test will contain the general level of the user that could be beginner, intermediate, or, or advanced, an individual score for pronunciation, fluency, and accent, an over score over 100%, an IELTS score predictor, and phonemic sound scores divided into 18 categories. These categories are divided into phonemic groups and similar sounds. For example, ELSA places the pronunciation of sounds of letters in the same category as uh, the sound of L and R. Because these consonants are very difficult to pronounce for some users and it causes confusion in their pronunciation. An example of this is when uh, some users or some people uh, pronounce light instead of right. Another trouble found in Ecuadorian learners it related with the with consonant clusters. These appear, appear when two consonants go together and speakers uh, usually omit sounds. It's common to, to listen uh, learners or students or, or people in Ecuador to pronounce uh, ask instead of asked. And some they add sounds to uh, saying gulu instead of glue for example. Okay. Let's continue. After obtaining Elsa's uh, test result, the app selects a personalized class for, for each user according to their strengths and, and weaknesses, dividing the tasks into planets uh, that contain classes for each sound. Well, the advantages of this app is that uh, thanks to its attractive and entertaining interface, it motivates students to learn and practice the task of the software. And it has many tools that uh, reinforce the students' exercises. On the other hand, one of the disadvantages of this app is that it's not uh, totally free, since uh, there's a more complete version of this app which is paid and contains all the activities that cannot be accessed in the free version. And in addition, uh, this app requires uh, internet connection always, uh, since it doesn't have an, an offline, ver offline version. Well, let's talk about the methodology and approaches used in this uh, research. First, the research uh, makes use of both qualitative and quantitative approaches. Quantitative approach, since the data was collected, uh, tabulated, and analyzed uh, numerically, and a qualitative because the perceptions of the students were taken into account. This is also a field research because although the research didn't maintain direct contact with the study population because of the pandemic, the information was collected in real time in order to complete the objectives proposed at the beginning. This research uh, uses documentary bibliographic method in which several sources were collected to support the theory of this study. For example, uh, we, uh, it was used uh, papers, scientific journals, online articles, and, and books. The design of this research is experimental because it tries to, to, this, to demonstrate the hypothesis through data collection and measurement of this in order to obtain a concrete and precise results of the study. In addition, to achieve the objectives of the research, a pretest 
and a post test was carried out with um, with which uh, the study population was measured and, and correlated. So, so the uh, process executed in this research was the following. First, it was selected the experimental population that were four students of second semester of Pedagogía de los Idiomas Nacionales y Extranjeros program at Universidad Técnica de Ambato. Then, the pretest was applied to the students using the ELSA's interface. After that, the use of ELSA's pickup was socialized through some connection in order to carry out the activities and continue with the research study. This experiment in which the student had to carry out the activities proposed by the app lasts for about five weeks. Then, the post-test uh, was applied using the same software in the students and the results were tabulated and analyzed in order to determine if there was a, a change in the, in the results. And finally, the SRB was uh, applied to the students in order to find out their perception of the app. Well, let's check the analysis of the results. In these graphs, you can observe the average of 10 by the group in the pretest and in the post-test in each section. In the sections where there was a, a more remarkable change, it was in the sounds of the consonant clusters, which is uh, represented in red color, where in the pretest an average of 45.5% was obtained, and in the post-test an average of 62.7% uh, was obtained. In, in those sounds where there was not much change, was in the sounds of L and R, with an average of 86.6% in the pretest and 85.9% in the post test. And in the sounds of P, T, and K, that is in great color, with an average of 79.2% in the pretest and 82.3% of the 100% in the post test. Okay, we, to verify if the use of this uh, app had positive results in terms of improving uh, the English pronunciation, a comparison was made between the average of the pretest scores with the post test average. The average of the students in the pretest score was of 61.5%. While the average of the students post uh, test score was of 70.3%. So it can be affirmed that there was an, an improvement in of the pronunciation of the students after applying the use of LCS pickup. After applying the treatment, the students were survived with a survey that contained uh, 10 items of multiple choice divided into two categories. The first one uh, was about the, the ease of use of the app, and the other section was about the usefulness of the app. Most of the students agreed that LSS Speak is an easy to use app um, for, for new users, and they considered that this tool uh, helped to, to enhance their pronunciation and even their confidence to improve their, their skills. The results uh, show that uh, there was a considerable improvement with the use of LSS pickup. However, uh, there are certain uh, deficiencies in the correct pronunciation of words, which can be corrected with the constant use of the, the mobile application. For this reason, this is study six uh, to find a solution to this problem, where it shows how through its uh, eye-catching interface, it got the students' attention and motivated them to, to learn the pronunciation of each phonemic sound, which is uh, essential to improve pronunciation of the, of the English language. So, in order to conclude to this pronunciation, we are going to, uh, presentation, sorry, we are going to talk about the conclusions of the, of the research. First, the use of the LSS pickup in the development of English pronunciation is of great importance. And this was supported by the analysis of the results obtained in this research that demonstrate an improvement in the students' abilities, especially in pronunciation. 
It is concluded that uh, there are many factors that limit the English pronunciation. Among the most important in here in Ecuador are the influence of their mother tongue, the fossilized errors of students, and the, the limited methodologies and tools that, to teach and learn the, the English language. After the analysis of the results obtained in the pre test and in the post test, uh, and the survey carried out to the students, it's concluded that the LSSP had a positive effect uh, on the development of the students' per, uh, pronunciation. And there is a direct relationship between LSSP CAP through the data collected from the pre test and from the post test. And finally, LSSP CAP and its benefits in pronunciation are uh, supported through the perceptions that learners demonstrated with the use of this the mobile lab. Thank you for your... Thank you so much, dear teacher Christian. It was a total pleasure to listen about to listen to about this uh, fantastic application. So now we will be as we will be answering some questions from our audience now. So the first question that we have is from Yvonne Navas. Uh, she wants to know if the application is free or maybe do you have to pay something to access to all the uh, maybe the characteristics or all the functions in this case? Okay. Uh, you can you can download uh, this app uh, through uh, iPhone or or Android uh, for for free, but uh, this app uh, is not totally free. You can access to um, a lot of activities in the free version, but the complete version is paid, and uh, it contains a lot of. Uh, activities that you can't access in the free version. Dear teacher Christian, so how long have been your students, or in this case, the small population uh, practicing in this application? Or what will be your recommendation in order to see a, a real improvement in our pronunciation? Okay, well, the, the treatment of this uh, study uh, last, uh, lasted for, uh, for about uh, five weeks, and the students had to practice uh, for about uh, 15 or 20, uh, the five weeks of the, of the use with this app, we, can, uh, we could observe that the students had uh, improved with the use of LC Speak. Thank you so much, um, Professor Christian. Um, thanks also for the great presentation for us today. Um, well, it was a pleasure to have you with us. So this concludes the presentation number six. Um, and thank you all for attending. We really appreciated you joining us today. So we hope you have learned from this application called Elsa Speak, you can find it in, in, in Android or in Apple, and you can download and practice every day. So thanks again, and please stay here to the next presentations.
afternoon with everyone. Welcome to the eighth presentation of the first day of the conference, Challenges, Opportunities, and Reflections on ELT. My name is Carlos Minga. I'm a student of fourth semester in the English language teaching major in UNAI. I am responsible for hosting this presentation today, and I am very glad to welcome Dr. Magali Angeloni, who is the director of the Master of Public Health online program at New England Institute of Technology in East Greenwich. She also holds a Master of Business Administration degree from Providence College and a Doctor of Public Health degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her research interests include public health workforce development, interprofessional education, quality and performance improvement, and online education. And today she will present best teaching practices to engage students in the virtual environment. You can write your questions, comments, or doubts on the comment section and at the end of the presentation, Dr. Angeloni will answer those questions from the audience. Without further ado, here's our guest. We can start with the presentation, Dr. Angeloni. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Carlos, for that introduction. It is my pleasure to be here for the first time with you guys, and I am going to make the best of the time that I have. So you already know that I work from the New England Institute of Technology in, that is located in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, the United States. And the objective for this afternoon is to talk about um, the policies that uh, would help you promote a student engagement and as well as offer some ideas for student-centered strategies that you can use in the online environment. As a way of background, as Carlos mentioned before, I am a public health professional. And for um, those of you who probably don't know what is public health, you have heard about obviously the COVID-19 this year, that is a public health issue. What we do is not clinical work, but it's rather to do anything that is uh, either research, education or something so that we can protect and educate communities to be healthier. I am a professor of the Master of Public Health and the program has been online. So I have been doing this for four years, teaching online exclusively, and I work with instructional designers. So the presentation and the best practices that I have identified are based on my four years of instruction that I have had and what I think that it's the most, the things that work the best. So let's start with class policies. I think that the best way to engage students is to tell them from the start that this is what we are going to do, that we need to have their participation. So um, some ideas here about to have policies in the class include make the grade part of the participation and give them a few methods in which they can participate. For the extroverts, it's easy to raise their hand or talk, but for the introverts, they are a little more shy and they would prefer to like type a question in the chat or like do um, an emoticon or like use an icon or something so that they can say that, yes, I understand and stuff like that. Um, I tell my students that if they don't answer the question, then I will just call their name. So they need to participate in one way or another. So that is a good thing. But also at the beginning of the class, we should try to give them um, a minute to say, okay, if you need to do a test, if you need a bathroom break, or if you need to grab a snack, it's okay, go do it right now, because then we're going to concentrate in class. So everybody's ready, and then we go from there. So once they know the policies, then hopefully they will follow it. The second strategy that has to do with the student-centered strategies is this one that probably all of you are familiar with, but um, in any case, this is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we need to best first make sure that the students are prepared, that they are, they are safe, they are comfortable, they ate. That's why it's so important to have breakfast before go to school so that they can have that, they are ready to start. And then we can consider the Bloom's taxonomy to, you know, the educational objectives, the material that we are going to do so that they can learn, they are better prepared to learn. So part of the, you know, the ideas that come to mind are, you know, so let's get ready. And remember, I am only talking about the environment um, online. So, you know, send the text. If you have an emergency or something, grab the phone, send the text now before we get started. Um, if you need a stretch, then let's make sure that we have a stretch and take a bathroom break or whatever. Now that that is okay, now that we can move on with the material that we can discuss in class. The next strategy is a little more complicated, but I think that it's the one that is the most comprehensive that I am going to discuss with you today. It's called the universal design for learning. 
that is called UDL. That is the acronym that we use. So the UDL design has an example right here. So on the left, as you can see, the, the assignment that we are offering the students is um, read this article and write a summary, okay? That is the, um, before you apply the UDL principles. But if using um, UDL, then the assignment, the same assignment would be presented in this way on the right side. I have provided you this article, but if you prefer another one, you have 10 minutes to look at this site or magazine and choose another one. And then write an objective summary of the article, and then you have the following choices to do the work, right? So then we let them do it with a rubric. We let them do it. They can sign up for like a one-on-one -on -one meeting, writing conference, so then I can help the student. They can use highlighters or graphics. They can use, they can have instructions. There's also a guide to annotate. So there is different options, right? So on the left side, we have an assignment that is very simple, straightforward, easy to understand, but it doesn't give you any options. On the right side, applying the universal design for learning, we have a few options that the student can actually choose. So the UDL concepts are taught in like days, you know, um, so this is not an easy fit, um, you know, but I am basically presenting it to you in like two minutes. So what it does is that basically it is about that our brain works differently in what we do and why we do things, what we do and how we do things, right? So because of that, then the best way to work with everyone is to have multiple options, multiple means of doing, engaging students, representing a staff, and then um, multiple ways of expression. So basically, in a nutshell, one example of that is that um, if you want the students to write a paragraph about your weekend, and I know that most of you here in the audience are teachers who are teaching English to people who do not speak English, who speak other languages. So if you want somebody to write a paragraph about their weekend and write it in English, then you can give them the choices. So you can tell me about your weekend by either writing a paragraph or maybe you want to compose a song and then you want to sing the song about it. Or you can write a poem about your weekend or you can act your weekend. You can do things and wear a mask and a wig or whatever and then show me what happened in your weekend. Or you can draw it and explain it. So there is all of these options. And these options, you may notice that even give you a little more options, in, um, a little more options. And hopefully, because they have options and they can say, oh, maybe I can act or maybe I'm going to do a song or I'm going to do a video, I'm going to do whatever. Then they, they, you are actually touching upon like the creativity. They may, they might be able to write the paragraph in like, you know, 10 minutes or whatever, but they might be able to draw it and do a much better and then, you know, become creative and, you know, get more um, or get more out of that assignment. So the whole thing about UDL is providing options, making sure that the, the kids who are not good um, writers or not good speakers or are not good at these or that, then they all have an option to do the same assignment. As I said, as I said, UDL has, there's a lot, there's a discipline in itself. I don't know if you have heard about it, but I wanted to give you a little bit of that. And of course, if you have, um, if you're interested in getting more, I put some resources here and I believe that you will have access to this, this slide so then you will have more information. The one thing to, um, to keep in mind is that what is essential for some students is good for all students. So if we want to make the classroom easier, we can use this way to do it. So um, the other strategy is to make it interactive, 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 interactive. I, uh, I feel really bad when my students are falling asleep and I think that, you know, I need to do something so that they wake up and they listen to the, the material that I am discussing. So one way, uh, there is many ways to interact with the students. Um, one of the ways that, especially if you are teaching English, I think that if you get the song and the lyrics and then you let them um, rehearse and then sing, and they will be able to pronounce more because, and especially if you like a song, then they can really, you know, talk about it and then pronounce it and practice it and practice it. And while they're singing, it's easier. Of course, also using the subtitles in cartoons and movies, you read it, you listen. Um, 
and then I, I'm looking at you're watching the movie. So you are, you know, you're watching it, but you're also reading the subtitles, the subtitles and you are listening to how uh, people speak in English. Compare notes with classmates. Um, I don't know if you know about uh, MIT, the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, uh, but they one of the things that they do with all of the students is that they let them do homework in groups. So whatever homework they have, they encourage the students to work together and share because there is many ways in which they learn. If they sit down and one doesn't know one thing, the other one can cover that. So I think that that is very, very useful. Same, um, likewise, like to take notes or like debrief in groups. Uh, many times I cover a topic and material with my students and then I ask them, okay, what do you remember about everything that I said? And then they, you know, they tell me, I remember this and then I take notes, put it in the screen and I read they said, somebody else said, I remember these other things. So then I debrief, what did they learn? What did they find interesting in the discussion that we just had? And, um, you know, and then I take notes and I, highlight them and, and all of that. And then if they didn't mention something specifically that I mentioned and they forgot, then I said, and what about that? And that will, you know, sometimes will tell me that maybe they didn't listen to it or I didn't explain it sufficiently. So then I need to go back and cover that again. And also um, getting students to tell us some experiences, some examples about things that they know or that they do. So these interactive activities are really, really important. And um, especially if we do short lectures, because if we stay in front of the in front of the classroom and then we just talk for like 45 minutes, then they definitely will fall asleep or they will, you know, the brain will just wonder. Um, so I, I really feel that this is important. And if you see here on the left on this picture, the I don't know if you can read it, but there is a sign at the top that says impossible mixture. So this is, uh, you know, like a chemistry class or something, and the, it says impossible mixture. So now you stay in front of that, you stare, and then you see, so why is this an impossible mixture? Why is this not mixing it? So it's like another way to kind of let them this over that the students will look at it and they will want to know why is that is this not mixing so having that kind of um, exercises I think that it's very very valuable um, so I wanted to also show you how I use uh, zoom and I know that many of you uh, use zoom there's other platforms as well um, but there is a way specifically that I use Zoom. And the only way that I could share with you and I can show you how I do it, uh, it's through a video. So I'm going to um, I'm going to play a video now that is going to talk about how you use the Zoom. And then you also for, you know, so you get students to give you some feedback and they can participate in an anonymous way. Sometimes I ask my students, well, not sometimes, many times I ask them, so what do you think about this? Did you understand that? Do you have any questions? Do you have that? And then many of many of the times they don't answer, they don't ask any questions. So um, I tend to like give them a space where they can uh, give me their thoughts, but they can give me their thoughts without a name. So then they are not afraid that I'm going to do something with their grades if they said, well, I didn't understand that or I didn't like the class. So getting anonymous participation, I think that it's also important. So whenever is possible, you're not gonna do that all the time, but whenever it's possible, just try to get anonymous participation from the students. And this is how I'm gonna show the Zoom. So Carlos, if you can play the video anytime, that would be great. This presentation I prepared for you so then you can um, figure out how to use Zoom and to get your students to participate with it. So one of the options is to use the whiteboard. When you use the, when you select the whiteboard, you get all of these options on the screen that you can use. The good news is that you have options to text, to draw, to use uh, geometrical figures and other things. But most importantly, there is an option at the top that appears that says more. If you click there, you have the ability to enable annotation for others. So that means that anyone in your class can also annotate put text or draw or something. And if you want to make um, the, the participation anonymous, you can hide the names of, annot of annotators so you don't know who is who's typing what. 
And um, the other option that is available here is to share the sound. So if you are to present the video, you can just click there and that is how the sound will be available also to the people who are attending. And lastly, if there is a lot of people attending, you just click at the bottom, there is a plus sign, you get another page, brand, brand new page, and then you just keep going with the class. And you notice that now you have page number two, and additionally, you can save it at the end. So you, there's no need to do anything else, you can save it and you can uh, use the work later if you need to. Second option is to do the presentation the way I'm doing here right now. So the option is to, is, share and then what you do is you will select the PowerPoint as virtual background. That is the option that is on the advanced part of it. When you do that, then it asks you to select the PowerPoint that you have already done and voila, here it is. We have the uh, presentation. This is me talking to you right now, but this is the presentation that as it normally would appear. Now, you don't wanna have like the picture at the top. So what you do is right click, hide self view, and that will disappear. And then you only have one of you in the, in the slide. You notice that there are lines around it. So that means that you are able to move that and place yourself at whatever corner you want or anywhere in the slide. And also you can make it larger or smaller. Okay, so this is it. So I hope that you enjoy it. Now we're gonna show you the other tools that I had for you today. Two more tools that I would like to share with you. One of them is like the emojis. So if you go to this website, there is a lot of them and all you have to do is like search for what you're looking for. Let's say arm and then there it comes. So then you have a mechanical arm, different kinds. And let's say that I want, um, I want this arm or I want the flex biceps. You select it and then it will give you like that. It also has like a couple of options here. And then all you do is copy and it's ready to paste in whatever you have. PowerPoint in Microsoft Word on the screen, anywhere you want, okay? And that makes it fun when you are teaching. So that is one of the good tools. Second tool that I wanted to mention is the Linoid. This is a um, free account that you open. I already have mine and I am already gonna show you. So there is many uh, canvases. You will create a canvas and what you do is then you have um, a wide like a board and you can also make it anonymous. You can uh, copy and paste, you can post things here. And um, the way that you do it is, you know, you can select one of these papers and then you put, you make a note, you can change the colors and then you post it. For you as an instructor, if you wanted to post it, um, if you wanted to make it anonymous, then what you do is click in the information and then you have all of these things. So you click on this URL and then you share it in an email or anything and then the students, all they have to do is click on that link, they will come here and it is anonymous as well. It will not show the name of the person who is contributing. So that is all you have to do. I really hope that you enjoy these instructions and then you can use them soon. Thank you. I hope that you really enjoyed that short video that I did. I wanted to show you how to use it because I have many colleagues who have asked me how I do it. And um, so I wanted to offer that to you. That was the perfect way to do it. So um, what are we talking about in, in essence, in summary? What are we doing? What are we talking about as far as the teaching? So we are doing about the transformative approach, right? So we are saying that we need to like have our teaching to to become facilitators of the learning as opposed to just deliver instruction, right? So we want to do what is listed on the left side of the of this column here. And by the way, this was written by um, by a principal of a school, and the actual blog is at the bottom of the slide. So this is the the principal who was mentioning this came up with this. Um, table. So we want to make sure that we use strategies that are student-centered, that are easy for the students, not easy for the teacher. 
right? We want to make sure that we want to personalize it, you know, that let the students have some options so that they can really understand the material, but then they can present it in different ways because not everybody is the same. We are all different people. And we want to also let them learn anytime, anywhere, right? Learning happens at many places and in different settings. So if we record a session and then let them uh, watch it later, that is, that, is, that is a good approach. So we want to do that as opposed to just in the classroom learning. So, you know, give them assignments where they can actually go and test and, you know, and try different things and then tell you and summarize it after. And we should really try to do to get them to do it, to do something so that they can learn it as opposed to learn something and then try to do it. Whenever that is possible, I know that that may not work all the time. So anyway, um, given the students the option, it will be it really hopefully makes them also make uh, make uh, decisions easily and they can also get more creative in terms of what is possible and what they can do. So that is um, what I am recommending and hopefully that works for you guys. So remember, we learning in different ways. We are all different people. Learning happens um, when you are working, when you are walking, when you are observing things. The students should be our partners in learning as opposed to the people who just absorb what we know. Uh, give them more choices and this works for adults as well. So I believe that you guys are going to have access to the slides and um, this is it. I will be happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you very much, Dr. Angeloni. I hope you all enjoyed this amazing presentation. Now we will answer some questions that our audience have. The first question is, how can we apply these strategies with lower levels? For example, primary or secondary? When you say primary or secondary, are you talking about elementary school and then the high school? Yes, and mostly elementary yeah. school. Well, in the elementary school, I think that it depends on the grade. That will be a little more complicated, but definitely with the students that are a little uh, older, I think that, you know, after they are like 10, 11, 12, I mean, I think that they are, uh, you know, um, more capable of understanding certain rules. Like, you know, we are first going to make sure that the, these are the rules and we can put them on the class board and uh, on the board, you know. Um, we are going to uh, send the text and do this, you know, if you need a bathroom break or whatever. But remember, we are talking about virtual learning. So you are really not in front of them in person. You are just in the computer. So, uh, you know, so they can, and they can follow rules. I know that my experience in Ecuador is that we, that's how the way that we were brought up. We follow rules and we have a hard time uh, question authority. So I think that they will follow the rules, you know, the participation is important. Um, do this in the chat. Do this with the uh, with the emoticons and things like that. I think that it will be easier um, if you try it. Hopefully, you try it. Okay, thank you. On your on the second question, we have how can we grade the post. Uh, students make on Canvas. Uh, platform. Well, I use the Canvas platform in. Um, in um, in my school and there is a function to grade it so then if you plan everything there there is a grade book and then you can use it i don't know if you use it there um, but there is a way to do it you set up an, an assignment and then you say how many points is worth and you can even put a rubric in it so the students know what how many points are going to get for what Okay, and our last question is, uh, what can we do as teachers with those students who have no technologies technological resource, yeah. resource um, access. So that is a real challenge for you guys because I know that there are some students who really don't have, you know, don't have a phone or don't have a computer or don't have internet. Um, I don't really have an answer for that. If you don't have internet, then you're not going to be able to attend a virtual class. And I think that, and that is what my presentation was all about. Um, I guess that you can still like record the classes and then you can post them somewhere in YouTube or something, but still the students need to have access to the, the internet so that they can watch it either later or something like that. Um, 
I that I understand. I was born in Ecuador. I know how the situation is. So I mean, that is a challenge. I don't have an answer. I'm sorry about that. Okay, those are very useful answers. Thank you again, Dr. Angeloni, for answering those questions and for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have with you, to have you with us. So uh, with this, we conclude this presentation. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you have learned and enjoyed this presentation. Please stay tuned at this link for our next presentation, Exploring Language Arts, the English Language Classroom. And if you want to access to the recorded conferences, you can do it by the uh, platform. There are all the recordings there and the poster's presentation. Thanks. <music>
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last presentation of today in the Congress, Challenges, Opportunities, and Reflections in ELT. My name is Estefan Anguisaca, and I'll be responsible for hosting this presentation. I am glad to welcome Dr. Tusha Rani. She's a senior lecturer attached to the Teacher Education Institute Malay Language Campus in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She currently heads the English language unit of her institute and has 25 years of experience teaching the subject in different levels. She is a member of several editorial boards of index journals dedicated to English language education and teacher education. In addition, she is also the author of several articles based on comics and graphic novels, multimodality and best practices. Her research interests focus on EFL, visual literacy, language arts, multimodality, design thinking, popular culture, and creative pedagogies. Remember that you can write all your, all your questions on the comment section. And we can start with the presentation, please. This presentation is Exploring Language Arts in the English Language Classroom. Let's start, please. Hello. I'm good to go. I can start, yeah? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, hello, okay. A very good uh, evening, everyone. It's actually morning in Malaysia. I'm Dr. Tusha, and my presentation today is entitled Exploring Language Arts in the English Language Classroom. I am currently uh, a teacher educator or a senior lecturer at the Teacher Education Institute of Malay Language Campus, which is based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, a little bit background on my students. My students are basically uh, teacher trainees and uh, they go on to teach in Malaysian primary schools about graduation. So a uh, language art is the art of using language efficiently to communicate an idea. The skills of listening, speaking, and writing are pertinent learning and deeper understanding of learning that runs across the curriculum. Research shows that there are connections between the arts and academic achievement. In incorporating arts, specifically visual learning strategies that include painting, and images are beneficial, uh, according to Iftekhari 2020. And this also supports the embracement of multimodality in the classroom. Visual arts have a place in the English language arts classroom. And uh, Street further emphasizes the need to rethink, redefine, and redesign language and literacy in the classroom to meet the contemporary needs and skills of students. So a bit of, of course, information about the language arts course. Uh, this is the first time that I have actually introduced the course in my uh, institute. And uh, being in the new norm, it has been quite a challenge. But uh, I have seen through this semester, and uh, I am happy to report that we would be having this again uh, at the end of the uh, year. So uh, the course itself, the objectives are to create confidence, uh, develop oral skills, and promote creativity. And some of the pedagogist patterns that support this are uh, higher order thinking skills, 21st century learning skills, and new pedagogies in deep learning, which are very embedded in our uh, Malaysian teacher training curriculum. Um, so, according to the American National Council of Teachers of English, the basic categories of language arts are reading, writing, speaking, listening, and viewing. And the genres that I have actually explored with my students 
uh, this semester with stories, poetry, drama, and songs. But for today's uh, presentation, I would be looking into poetry. So uh, the problem statements are these language anxiety influenced by cognitive challenges, uh, the need to explore multimodality in the language arts classroom, and English poetry writing can be challenging for L2 students. So what are the objectives? The first objective is to gauge the efficacy of language arts in increasing students' proficiency levels in the English language. Uh, the second objective is to investigate how L2 students perceive the language arts. So I was guided by these two questions, which are, has the language arts subject increased students' proficiency levels in the English language? And what are the perceptions of the students towards the language arts subject? So this is a very simple studies and it's a case study uh, using qualitative methodology. The instruments I used is a questionnaire and my participants are all my trainees, 11 of them were Malay or Mandarin or Tamil are their first languages. Uh, a bit about writing poems and what am I going to do? So poetry is the genre selector and uh, they're going to do a visual analysis using a model that I actually came up with uh, called the basic model where they actually look into the background, salient, short in creating something. And this is how they would use the model to actually look at images and come up with a creation. And in this case, it's their, their poems. And uh, for this semester, I have actually used the images of uh, paintings. And uh, we looked into works of Van Gogh, uh, Tan Ge Kun, who is a Malaysian uh, artist, and uh, Frida Kahlo. So why use paintings? Uh, to me, uh, it is one of the underexplored uh, area in, in teaching. And uh, they bring such rich, uh, rich uh, prompt to, to writing poems. So pictures aren't just pictures. They are the tone, the width, the style, the plot, the people all in one. So these are some of the paintings. So uh, we're going to look at how my students actually uh, looked into these poems and came up with their products because I felt that uh, this session gives a perfect opportunity for me to also share some of their works. So this is the first painting that I used in my class, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. And uh, surprisingly, uh, this student came up with this very good poem. And if you can see, she has used words like night, sky, and these are all so related to that particular image, how she has studied the salient uh, points of that image. And uh, this is an student of mine, this is a recital. We'll just quickly look at that. Okay, and uh, she has actually used uh, in short to videotape her presentation and upload it on YouTube. So these are the ways that they have used uh, social uh, media by uh, recording and by uploading it on YouTube for me to evaluate. This is the second painting, Strolling by Tan Ge Kun. And um, this was a wonderful interpretation of the poem. She's a woman, not a girl, not a child. She's a woman, can be good, can be bad. They think she's weak, but only she knows what she's capable of. She is a woman, Dave, and she is a wife, a loving heart. No one can compare the heart of a thousand mothers. She's a woman, protect her, love her endlessly. Uh, written by, of course, a woman, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> one of my students. And um, this is Frida Kahlo's uh, The Bus. And uh, this is another interpretation of my students of that particular image. And, and see uh, uh, how she have used the word bus and the clothes that uh, the passengers are using and what it means to her. And I particularly like the way she has interpreted it where they are all traveling to their own destinations, but they never know that they would be traveling to their own death someday. And this is uh, another interpretation of that same image, but she has looked into journey and how life is related to it. So uh, looking at all the poems that we have discussed, when I gave them the assessment, that was just part of uh, their assessment. They also had to produce uh, lesson plans on how they would teach poetry to younger kids. And they also had to do a short skit. But I particularly picked out poetry because later on you would see that uh, poetry was their favorite genre in the course. Okay, so this, so these are the results. So you could see that before language arts, uh, they were here, and after the introduction of uh, of uh, language arts, uh, they have actually uh, improved in their proficiency. And what are their perceptions? Uh, most of them found the language arts course was was challenging uh, initially, and then uh, I was uh, initially apprehensive. They were also apprehensive about the cost. But in the end, they, they, they say that uh, it had helped them overcome their English language mistakes. And it has also made the English language learning more interesting with 72.7 of them saying so. The course has also enhanced their language communication skills at 63.6% of students agreed to this. And finally, the language arts course has also uh, increased their four skills. And what are some of the takeaway lessons? Okay, it has corrected their grammar, speaking skills, confident in doing everything becoming more creative, building character. And uh, those are some things that they have uh, evolved to be. So the conclusion is a carefully planned language arts teaching and learning session. Take students needs into consideration will be able to increase students proficiency levels. Lessons that include multimodality encourage the development of multi literacies. Adopting the right teaching techniques evoke interest and motivation. And, and the results of my study actually concurs with some of these studies, increased creativity, improved communication skills, use of poetry, which promotes meaningful and, and successful language learning, increased enjoyment and engagement. So the adoption of visual arts into the classroom can be beneficial for any subject, but as this study shows, specifically for the language arts. And more importantly for me, language arts has the ability to connect with students' lived experiences. Finally, just to share, I have actually asked my students to showcase their, their productions and I use Padlet for them to share their ideas. And this is a fantastic platform to share with your students. And uh, yes, uh, Stafford uh, opinion on painting says that even a cursory glance reveals a multitude of tantalizing and enigmatic details and video on language acquisition 
says that pertinent to make language learning personally contextualized and a meaningful activity for the learner. And how all this came together in this study was very evident with the results that was derived. Yeah, so uh, that's about it. So if you have any questions, you can reach me at, at that uh, email address. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your amazing presentation. A lot of teachers and students are saying they love your your presentation. It's really interesting. And I want to remind all of you that you can watch the presentation of the posters on YouTube and also on the EVEA. Thank you again, all of you, for attending today's presentation and workshop. And I hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>